Welcome to Merrill Auditorium. I'm standing on a different part of the stage than I normally do, but it's nice to see you. If we haven't met before, I'm Robert Moody. I'm the music director of the Portland Symphony Orchestra. Um, this is my eighth season and the Portland Symphony's 91st season, but I'm actually here to talk to you about my ninth season and the Portland Symphony Orchestra's 92nd season. This is the first glimpse into where we are heading for the 2016 2017 season. Uh, just a couple of things to mention before we talk to you about the details of the season itself. One is that there is a, a concert that uh, got a nice bit of attention. Uh, fortunately, or for me personally, ever so slightly unfortunately lately, and that's a concert that will be coming up on July the 4th. We will be doing our annual July 4th concert on the Eastern Prom. And I can tell you for sure about at least one piece of repertory that will be on that concert, unfortunately. Uh, our assistant conductor, Norman Wynn, and I had quite the bet going about the college football national championship. I'm the son of a Clemson grad and spent my entire life going to Clemson football games. Norman is an Alabama grad himself. And uh, had that game just been three quarters long, I would not have to make the announcement I do now. But uh, Alabama did win, bless their hearts, as we say in the South. And because of that, on July 4th, for a moment anyway, I will don an Alabama jersey and I will conduct the University of Alabama fight song. So if you would like to come see me experience the worst three and a half minutes of my life, come on down to the Eastern Prom on July the 4th. I thought you might like a couple of words about how we put a season together, just the quick overview of how things happen. It begins um, really with me thinking and pondering about music that first and foremost I'm interested in conducting, that I, that I love and that I feel that if I stood on the podium and led an orchestra and soloist or soloists and chorus, et cetera, through that work, that it would be a very uh, satisfying and rewarding and most importantly artistic experience. So I think about those and those ideas come to me uh, in random ways. Just something triggers a memory of a piece and I will write it down on a slip of paper. Quite often I'm driving in the car listening to the radio and before uh, satellite radio where I could click and look now and see exactly what the what the piece is on the screen used to be I would just pull the car over if I needed to and wait until the piece was over to find out. Let them tell me what it was if I hadn't heard it before. Again, I would jot that down on some random piece of paper. Uh, now I use my cell phone and take pictures of the said satellite radio screen so I can remember the name of the piece. That's sort of how I begin the process. At the same time, we gather as many opinions and ideas as we can with no promise, no guarantee that we'll perform any one specific piece, but I'm always very interested to know what people think. Many members of the Portland community have been very um, active in sending me emails and sending letters and saying, hey, have you ever thought about doing such and such piece? Or I would really love to hear this guest artist or what have you. We also assemble in the spring of every year, usually around March or April, we assemble the orchestra. Uh, we lure them with pizza between rehearsals and we have basically a brainstorming session. And I sit and I and Norman, my assistant conductor, is usually with me and we have just one of those large uh, easels, flip charts, and we just say, call out, brainstorm. What would you like to play? What are you interested in? What great guest artists have you worked with, perhaps in Boston, perhaps with the Rhode Island Philharmonic that we should bring here to town? Etc. So those are, those are just some of the ways the process begins and over the course of about six to eight months from those days in the spring until we make an announcement typically in January, we take all those random slips of paper and photographs off of iPhones and emails and letters and we sort of just, if you will, assemble them and then we sort of do our very special thing, our special zen-like thing and we try and find the right fit, the right permutation. Uh, with every passing year, connected as, as I am knowing the Portland community more and more, I feel that we get ever closer to the mark of that wonderful marriage of the, that which is incredibly important to me musically, incredibly important to the Portland community, to the orchestra, etc. So um, we feel really good about this current season, for example, 
Um, if you did not uh, make it to yesterday's concert, you have one more opportunity tomorrow night. I will tell you that personally, this is one of the most satisfying concerts I have conducted in a very long time. And to give you an example of how pieces come about and how they make it to a program, um, the Beethoven 8, of course, is part of our Beethoven cycle. I'm going to talk about that more in just a moment, conducting all nine Beethoven symphonies in a three-year period. The Strauss um, excerpts, the Strauss works that you heard or will hear tomorrow night, came from a conversation I had with John Crosby, the founder of Santa Fe Opera, in 1999. It took from 1999 until 2016 to bring this to fruition. But when I was working as an assistant conductor and chorus master at Santa Fe Opera, John Crosby, who founded Santa Fe and is, was, he passed away, he was one of the um, greatest devotees of the Strauss operas, all of them, all 15 Strauss operas. And he said to me, you're an orchestra conductor, you need to be programming the great orchestral music from Strauss opera, the works that never get programmed. And he gave me a stack, he was ready, a stack of copied music from his scores that he thought I should check out. And you heard either yesterday or we'll hear tomorrow only, gosh, 10% of what he recommended. So there's lots more of that great music to come. But I do hope you'll make it to the concert. Okay, let me talk to you now about where we are in our planning for the 16-17 season. You're going to hear me walk through concerts. I'm going to give you much information about the Tuesday and Sunday classical series. Um, not every I is dotted or T crossed yet. Um, some, some contracts with certain artists, certain guest conductors, etc. are verbally taken care of, but uh, Carolyn Nishan, our CEO, has not signed her name to it, and we don't dare say certain names out loud until that is done. Uh, but most everything is done, and you'll see the repertory we're aiming for and uh, just the exciting season ahead. I was offered this job, by the way, exactly on my 40th birthday. That was May 2nd of 2007. On that day, I did not have to do this, but now, so I can make sure I tell you the right things, I shall do this. Okay, we are opening the concert, the opening the cycle in um, October. The opening concert cycle will be a double, and that's our parlance for a concert which will be performed both on the Sunday series and the Tuesday series. Um, it will be a continuation of the Beethoven uh, cycle. There are three Beethoven symphonies left next season to perform, and the first one you'll hear in the fall is the great Beethoven Fourth Symphony. I'm extremely excited that we will be making the New England premiere of the Bates Cello Concerto. Mason Bates wrote a cello concerto for Joshua Roman. Josh Roman is one of the finest young cellists playing. He actually won the job of principal cello of the Seattle Symphony when I think he was like five years old. Okay, I think actually he was 19 or 20, but he took the job only for a couple of seasons and then he left to become a touring concerto artist. He is a phenomenal player. I've conducted him a few times with orchestras around the country. Um, I think many of you know this, but just in case you don't, Mason Bates, the composer, is um, one of the most performed composers living today. In fact, a recent survey showed that of living American composers, the most often performed composer was John Adams. The second most often performed living composer was Mason Bates. Mason Bates just finished a five-year stint as composer in residence for the Chicago Symphony. He is now the first ever composer in residence for the Kennedy Center. Speaking of my old stomping grounds, Santa Fe Opera, they just announced that they are premiering his first opera in the summer of 2018, and it's a summer, it's an opera based upon the life of Steve Jobs. I, I, I love to brag on Mason because I've known Mason since he was 15 years old. I was a groomsman in his wedding. He is one of my closest friends on the planet, and as you, if you've been around here for the past few years, you know that I program quite a lot of Mason Bates. I'm so proud of his work, and um, I continue to tell him that composers are the ones that live forever. The rest of us are sort of footnotes to music history, but I've made my place, my footnotes secure because I've commissioned enough Mason Bates works. I'll be at the bottom of a page somewhere as the guy who commissioned a Mason Bates work. So I'm really excited. The concerto itself is thrilling. It has an almost otherworldly, sometimes Eastern, but wonderful quality to it. And it really shows Josh's ability to their greatest extent. We finished that concert with a 
we like to open a season with a bang, and we always look for a piece that can do that, and we finished that concert with the Pines of Rome. Uh, listen, if you haven't experienced the Pines of Rome by Respighi live, you just, I don't know, you haven't experienced live music, live surround sound to be sure. Um, it's a phenomenal work, and it finishes with a movement called the Pines of the Appian Way, and that includes a wonderful orchestra on stage, great usage of our Kochmar organ, plus antiphonal brass who are blaring away up in the balcony. So, great way to kick off the season. Beethoven's Fourth, Bates Cello Concerto, Respighi Pines of Rome. The next concert is a features a piece that I have been trying to get into our repertory here for a very long time. Year after year, I have had this one on the piece of paper and down on the table and trying to keep it from going to the chopping block. We finally have the right set of circumstances to make it work for next year. If, if you have been around, you know that I'm a great fan of the music of Bela Bartok. We have done the Bartok Violin Concerto. We've done the Miraculous Mandarin, uh, the Concerto for Orchestra. One of those pieces on my bucket list is the Bartok work entitled Bluebeard's Castle. And we perform Bluebeard's Castle next year for you. Um, this is a work, it, I know that we did a basically fully staged opera last year. The opera we did was Poulenc Dialogues with the Carmelites with director and costumes and sets and props and the whole thing. This is quite different. It is an opera, but it is for only two singers, um, a bass baritone and a soprano, Bluebeard and Judith, Judith, and it's a phenomenal story. It's sort of a psychological in-depth story as much as anything, but Bluebeard, in a, in a grand nutshell, Bluebeard is bringing his latest wife, his latest love, his latest um, conquest, if you will, into his castle. And she sees that in this castle there are, well, seven doors. And to make it quite simple, she says, what's behind, oh, Bluebeard, what's behind door number one? And he says, oh, I can't tell you. I could never let you know what's there. And she persists and pleads, and so he finally shows her. And there's it's all sorts of booty and surprises behind each door. When they get to the fifth door, he says, I really, really can't tell you what's behind here. And she says, please. And so he shows her, and it's all the riches and gold and jewels he has acquired, and it's some of the best um, moving progression of major chords that you've ever heard in your life. And i got to tell you, making it through this and listening to this wonderful harmony of Bartok, when you get to that moment and the fifth door opens, this string of major chords. I, I have experienced this before. It seems like everyone in the room just kind of goes, ah, oh. sort of the sun shines and everything opens up. Uh, they make it to the seventh door, and I don't know if I, I want to give you a spoiler alert or not, but they make it to the seventh door, and he really, the most emphatically, I can't tell you what is there, and she persists, and there inside the seventh door lie the, or stand the, should we say, kind of zombified bodies of his former wives and former loves, at which point Judith goes and joins them. It's the happy, uplifting opera you see. But the music is phenomenal. I think some of the best music written in the 20th century. It wanted to have a, the, the, uh, the work is about 60 minutes long, 65 minutes long, something like that. So not quite a full concert. And we wanted to give you a work that would be a really nice, um, comparative and something really kind of antithetical to, to the Bartok in structure and style. So we are opening the concert with the Bach Concerto for two violins, often known as the Bach Double. And we look for a chance every season to feature members of our own orchestra, and this is that chance. Uh, two of our violinists, our violinist who you see most often sitting second chair first violin, our assistant concertmaster, and our player who is sitting as acting second violin principal, that is Amy Sims and Sasha Callahan, are going to be featured playing that work. If you're wondering right now, well, what about Charles Dimmick, our great concertmaster? Don't worry, Charles and I are already scheming about his next concerto for the following year. Um, and Charles has been featured so many times, as he well deserves. But he was the first to say, let's look for a chance to highlight more of our great violinists in the orchestra. So you get this great comparison of Bach double concerto followed by the amazing music of Bartok. So that's the uh, second concert in the Tuesday series. It's in the Classical Complete series, and that's a Tuesday only. That's not on the Sunday series. The next concert after that 
falls also in November, and this is the Sunday uh, concert, Sunday, November 20th, and this one also is only on Sunday, not on Tuesday. This um, brings together a lot of things. One, a piece that I've wanted to conduct for a very long time, and I will tell you, most everything on the season next year, now that I'm you know, old enough to wear glasses, I have conducted quite a few times before. One work I've never conducted before is the Sibelius Fifth Symphony. So I will be leading the orchestra in the Sibelius V as the conclusion of this concert in November. We're going to open with a work that has been on the brainstorming list, sort of the shout out list from the orchestra for quite a long time, and that is a work by clearly one of my favorite composers, Richard Strauss, who we are doing this week. We're going to go back to his tone poems and do Richard Strauss's Till Eulenspiegel's Merry Pranks. In between, we've invited a guest artist who is a young violinist. I first worked with him with the Spokane Symphony um, a season and a half ago. I did the Sibelius Violin Concerto with him. Um, a lot of our members of the PSO, you may or may not know, also play in the Rhode Island Philharmonic uh, down in Providence. And this violinist played with them uh, just a few months ago. And it was nice serendipity because I had this violinist, Benjamin Bileman, on my list as someone we really had to bring to town. And then the players who played in Rhode Island came to me and said, we just played with a violinist that we have to get to Portland. It's this kid named Benjamin Bileman. Uh, ben Bileman is, he and Josh Roman are of the same era. He's in his early 20s. Um, grew up in Houston, Texas, but at, I think, age 13 already attended the Curtis Institute of Music. He made his debut with the Philadelphia Orchestra the um, year before last, and they immediately invited him back to return. He is a force to be reckoned with, one of the finest and most um, mature young artists I've ever come in contact with. I, you're going to be so happy to um, see and hear Ben Bauman play, and he's going to play the Prokofiev First Violin Concerto. That's a real treat. Um, because we, we are getting away from sort of that basic center canon of the violin concerti, doing one that's not performed as often. That is the concert in November. Everything, by the way, so far, I am conducting. Then in January, there is a Sunday concert. Um, I will not be able to conduct that concert. I'm, I'm sad that I won't because the repertory is fantastic. We do have a guest conductor um, verbally confirmed, and this conductor and I have talked and agreed upon the repertory. And I will tell you the repertory, but since the contract isn't signed, um, we will just wait to tell you this conductor's name in the very near future. Um, but the repertory is this, we open, they open with the Benjamin Britten 4C interludes from Peter Grimes. Man, some of the best. It's, it's difficult to find any music of Benjamin Britten that is not um, just phenomenal, but this is some of the best music of Peter Grimes, I think, that, one, that orchestras get to play, and they talk about it quite a lot there. When, when I mentioned this, this was the piece, I think, um, when I told the orchestra on Saturday, the repertory, this was the piece that got the most oohs and ahs. This one and, and uh, Bluebeard's Castle. So an incredible work. And to stay in the C vein, then we follow it up with Debussy's La Mer. Second half of the concert, Diane Walsh, pianist Diane Walsh, will play the Chopin Second Piano Concerto. Diane Walsh is an extremely accomplished pianist. She's played recitals all over the world. She was based for a very long time uh, in the New York area, but not too long ago she re relocated to Portland, Maine. And so this um, is wonderful for us to feature a great artist who lives in this area. I think you all may know that this is, she's not the first, there have been a number of artists who have had major performing careers around the planet and they have chosen Portland as their place to settle and be their base. So we're very happy that she's here and that she gets to play the Chopin with the orchestra. The next concert falls in February and in fact it falls on Sunday, February 12th and Tuesday, February 14th. I think that's a holiday, I am told. It's actually a great holiday for an orchestral concert. I always say for your wife, husband, boyfriend, girlfriend, spouse, partner, if you're looking for a good way to be impressive, invite them to the orchestra for Valentine's. I mean, that's a really good romantic, especially if we play for you great romantic music. And I guess one could say both of these symphonies, but one of the symphonies for sure fits the bill perfectly. It's kind of a story in seconds. Uh, the Beethoven Second Symphony and the Rachmaninoff Second Symphony. Beethoven Second is 
near and dear to my heart. I've conducted all nine of the Beethoven symphonies now, but the first one I conducted in my career back in 1991 was the Beethoven Second. So it's the symphony of the Beethovens that has been with me the longest, and I'm uh, looking so forward to it. Beethoven One and Two, I have said to you before, and Beethoven Eight, there's an argument about Beethoven Eight, which we're playing now, that it's closer to One and Two than maybe anything else. Others will say, well, no, it's closer to seven, but let's just stick with that first one for the moment and say that in that vein, Beethoven 1 and 2 are these just perfect works by a genius composer at the height of the classical, quote unquote, classical era before Beethoven went into the third symphony and sort of taking the entire world down a new path towards something called romanticism. So this is just the great archetype of the perfect classical symphony, and then Rachmaninoff II. Um, it, it, when people say to me, name the five symphonies that you most enjoy conducting, this one is always on the list. And again, I've conducted it probably more than maybe anything on the season next year. And um, just one piece of very fun uh, pop culture reference. If you have friends who don't typically come to our classics cycles, or you, they're not, they don't call themselves lovers of classical music, you might recommend that they come here for the Valentine's cycle and then tell them that they will get to hear, don't say Rachmaninoff second, tell them they'll get to hear the theme from the Eric Carmen pop 70s tune, Never Gonna Fall In Love Again. Okay, you, you have my, as music director, classical musician, you have my permission to say that. It gets them in the building perfect. Everyone know what I'm talking about? Never gonna fall in love again. Dee -dee 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 -dee. Good. I see some of you humming along with me. Now I have to tell you that when the clarinet plays it in the symphony, you will never want to listen to Eric Carmen again. It's so perfect, this melody as set forth by Rachmaninoff. So that is the double. That's both on Sunday and Tuesday in February. Um, the March concert, which is a Tuesday cycle concert, is a concert in which uh, we'll have two concerts in a row that will have no intermission, March and April. And in the March concert, uh, we're doing a piece that I have now conducted one time. This will be my second time. I promised my teacher at the Eastman School of Music that I would not conduct this piece until I was 40 years old. Well, 40 has come and gone, so now I'm allowed. Um, my teacher, I think some of you know, is Donald Nguyen. He came here and conducted the Haydn Creation. I, I began my life as a choral conductor, and I think when I was 19 or 20, more than anything, I wanted to be Robert Shaw. I wanted to be the person who got to conduct the greatest of choral works, and I, that's still probably the fire that burns the most deeply within me. And that work for next year, and the one I promised I wouldn't take on until I was at least 40, because as Mr. Nguyen said, you will not have lived enough to take on the Brahms Requiem until you're at least 40 years old. So I'm very happy that we'll be doing the Brahms Requiem next season. I will tell you that the program will behave as such. We will play um, a work by Bach, what I think is to be one of the most beautiful um, themes that Bach ever gave us. It's a tune, a theme, called Comme Susser Tod, Come Sweet Death. It was wonderfully arranged for full orchestra by Leopold Stokowski. There was a point where Stokowski arranged many, many Bach works for full orchestra, and a, a great number of them, I think, are just absolute gems. This is a five-minute work, and I think it sets the tone and sets the mood um, so perfectly. We then move from there, and, and I think very likely without any applause, we will just slide into the next piece, which is a work by a living composer named Dan Forrest, a very prominent choral composer, sort of in the ilk of a Morton Lauridsen or Eric Larson or something like that. And he wrote a work called In Paradisum, In Paradise, and he wrote it specifically to be a companion piece to the Brahms Requiem. Um, the text of In, Paradis In Paradisum begins and ends with um, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. And then it moves to a little bit of the, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. At the end, he does something very interesting and I think very poignant. He asks for handbell ringers. So we will have a, members of a handbell choir and they'll be stationed out sort of with you in the audience. And they will 
ring sort of an answer to the chimes on stage, and then they will exit, and they sort of exit into the lobby, and as we hear the handbells disappearing into the ether, I will begin the first downbeat of the Brahms Requiem. So I think it's going to be a really powerful um, experience, and um, I would hate to tell you that any, any concert is more important than any other, but the choral guy in me wants to tell you that make sure you don't miss the Brahms Requiem, that's to be sure. Uh, after that comes the April concert, and this is it. This is the big one, the finale of our Beethoven cycle, the Beethoven Ninth Symphony we do in April. This is, of course, a double. It's on the Sunday series and the Tuesday series, and only two pieces. Again, like, like in um, March, we will move without intermission. We'll play the Barbara Adagio for strings and then move into the Beethoven Ninth Symphony. Um, I've conducted Beethoven Nine a number of times. In fact, I had one great chance to make a CD of the Beethoven Nine. So I, I love the piece. And it seems like every time I get around to the, to the Beethoven Nine, I find myself thinking about the fact that this work, one of the most famous pieces on the planet, that it, was, it has been performed in much of its now nearly 200 year history over and over again to celebrate the end of strife, the end of war. You know, some very famous performances of this piece at the end of many a war and many a conflict in history. Uh, quite a few performances in 1919, quite a few performances in 1945, 1946, a most incredible performance that Leonard Bernstein led in 1990 at the fall of the Berlin Wall where he brought together members of East and West Berlin uh, to perform, changed a word even, he changed uh, Freude, Schöner Goethe Funken, Funken um, to um, free, I think he did Freiheit to freedom, uh, joy of the gods. So it's always been used to sort of celebrate the end of strife and yet, as we often note, unfortunately, we humans can't get away from falling back into strife. We can't seem to escape um, strife and war and hostilities. So I thought that I always think that the Barber Adagio for Strings, another piece that's become a piece of national remembrance, and because I like history, performed at the funeral for Franklin Delano Roosevelt, performed in choral version under the text Agnus Dei at the funeral for John F. Kennedy, performed by the Orchestra of St. Luke's um, on at Ground Zero just a few weeks after the World Trade Center fell. Um, it, I'm a string player, I'm a cellist, and I think this is, uh, I don't know of a more perfect piece. So we, we played the Barbara Adagio. It's 10 minutes long, nine minutes long. And as it fades away, we will begin the Beethoven Nine and move into the incredible Ode to Joy. So I hope it's gonna be a perfect way for all of you to celebrate the end of this um, bucket list of all nine Beethoven symphonies, one conductor, one orchestra, one concert hall. Um, one quick side note, we have not forgotten at all, not at all, that two of the Beethoven performances last year were snowed out. We have not, we are well aware, and we know that there's a, there are a number of people who did not get to hear uh, their performance of the Beethoven third or the Beethoven sixth. So we do have, we just don't know exactly the when or the wherefore or exactly details yet, but we do have the makeup concert coming. And I pray to the gods every day that no more Beethoven concerts get snowed out. Yeah, I think we can handle Beethoven three and six on one concert. I'm not sure how much of a marathon you want if any more of those concerts get, get snowed out. So anyway, just know that's coming. And then there's one more concert. That's, that's the finale of the Beethoven Festival. It's not the finale of the season because there's a Tuesday concert in May that will end the season. And I actually have not too much that I can tell you about this concert um, other than we have just finally got the contract secured for the guest conductor for that about 45 minutes ago. So we've been talking with my friend and colleague Marcelo Leninger for quite a while and we finally made sure that he is committed to conduct that concert. Marcelo Leninger is um, an amazing uh, conductor sort of of the next generation of conductors. A uh, great young conductor who most recently and importantly to this era area was uh, for quite a while the associate conductor of the Boston Symphony Orchestra. So he's well known in the area, um, conducting nationally, internationally. We are now working with Marcelo on the repertory 
Uh, we do know, I'm going to just tease you as close as I can without getting myself in trouble by administration. We do know who we are quite sure is going to be the guest artist. And we do know, I could tell you the instrument that this person is going to play, but I don't dare. But the instrument sounds like violence without violence at the end or something like that. And, she's got, and this player is going to play a really phenomenal concerto as well. So that one is to be, to be um, more great stuff to tell you about that coming very soon. Those are the classical concerts for the 16-17 season. I'm going to tell you about the Pops concerts next season, but before I do, this is a good chance to see if there are any questions. So you can think about the classical um, offerings before we move into different types of music. Yep. Yeah. Yes, the, the, the Choral Art Society is, will be with us for both the Brahms Requiem and the Forest in Paradisum, and then for the Ninth Symphony. Absolutely. Yeah. And we have some just tremendous uh, vocal soloists for both of those. And um, I just asked uh, Marjorie Gallant, our uh, marketing director, when tickets will be available. And I think the best way to say that is in a couple of weeks. Um, you will all be receiving the packet in your mailbox. Um, first to current subscribers, am I saying this right? Current subscribers to renew. And so if you're not a current subscriber, then this is your chance to get tickets early, subscribe away. And then a little bit after that, a few weeks later, um, s tickets will be available to those who don't subscribe. But I, obviously I'm here to support the fact that it's much better to subscribe, if at all possible. Great question. Other questions? Anyone? Yes? You play, uh, uh, have you played Mahler? Uh, any Mahler? Have you done the Song of the Year? It, uh, thanks for the question very much. So the question is, and, and one thing I think you don't see on here is Mahler. I, I will mention a few things. Since I've been here, we've done a nice amount of Mahler. We've done the Songs of a Wayfarer. We've done the First Symphony, the Second Symphony, the Fifth Symphony, the Fourth Symphony. I sort of said them in the wrong order, but those are the ones we've done since I've been here. And 17-18 um, will be my final season, and I'm thinking a lot about in my 10th and last anniversary season, what are the great pieces I want to do, and I can... I, you never want to say anything is 100% guaranteed, but I can't imagine as much Mahler as I have been committed to since I've been here. In fact, my first concert as music director designate here was the Mahler first. Um, so I think Mahler, I think it's a good bet that Mahler will re-rear his amazing, wonderful head in the, in the next announcement a year from now. Yes? Thank you, Mr. Tchaikovsky, for that final season, other than your... Yeah, the, the question is about Tchaikovsky. Yes, it's true. I guess, I guess we all get our fill. We get at least one Tchaikovsky a year if you come to the July 4th concert. And, um, you know, we knock it sometimes when we laugh about the 1812 Overture. In truth, it's a brilliant piece. Um, but yes, and thanks for saying it. And there are a few, as you, as you heard me go through with guest conductors, there are a few um, TBDs, and we're well aware of which composers and which repertory I have chosen, and, and therefore which composers are not yet, or either not or underrepresented. And so those are some of the ones that will show up even on this current season um, coming up, as well as, of course, my final season. Yeah. Anyone else? Let's talk about Pops. Here is the Pops concert uh, series for next year. Um, the first Pops concert is going to be a classic rock concert. And I can tell you that it really probably came about, at least here's how I'm going to take credit for it coming about, it came about because the most successful Pops concert we have ever had at the Portland Symphony, the record-breaking concert, was a concert in tribute to Billy Joel and Elton John, a concert called The Piano Men, by, created by our own concert manager, Joe Bouchet, who until that moment, I don't think the Portland community knew that other than making sure that everything works for stage management for a concert, he happens to be one phenomenal pianist and singer. And um, you know, hey Joey is going to become the sort of pop's anthem. But when he was clearly so successful on that uh, cycle, we started talking and we talked about the fact that we share, we're of a similar um, generation. I'm, I'm a, I've got a couple of years on Joey, but we, we share the same kind of cultural references from our middle and high school years. And we've talked a lot about 
that we have a great love for a set of bands that were so popular at the late 1970s, early 1980s. For me, that was middle and high school. And um, we're talking about Journey and Boston and Fleetwood Mac and the one I'm sort of saving for me personally as the best one is Kansas. I was a geeky fan of Kansas. You're saying, who is Kansas? Well, you probably heard of their Dust in the Wind. And certainly, how, how could you not know, carry on my wayward son? Anyone? Anyone? Come on, like the greatest rock anthem of all time. So I have begged Joey to please put carry on my wayward son in this and it is there. So Joey and his band open the season. Anything you want to say about it, Joe? Um, we describe the show as the songs that everybody sings in their car are much too loud and they think no one's watching. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Or they sometimes sing too loudly into a microphone when like 100 people are looking at them like I just did. Perfect. So that's the opening. So we have a great, uh, for people who are really love the late 70s, early 80s music or nostalgic for that era, that's the opening. We go to a very different era for the next concert. I guess we could say the 30s and the 40s, the era of the big band, because we have the United States Army Jazz Ambassadors. This is one of the great, great um, swing, Dixieland, bebop, of course, patriotic anthems, uh, jazz bands in the US Army. I mean, this is one of their premier groups and we've actually been sort of trying to lure them to be part of our concert series ever since we had the phenomenal success we had with the U.S. Naval Academy Men's Glee Club. That was such a, a concert experience that I think none of us will ever forget. And so that led us to thinking that something like this would be a nice follow up as well. So the U.S. Army Jazz Ambassadors make the second Pops concert. After the holidays and once we're into the winter in late February, we'll do a concert it's, this goes not to the late 70s, but to the late 60s. It is sort of crazy to say this out loud, but 2017 will mark the 50th anniversary of the Beatles, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band album. It's sort of crazy that that is the case. And um, a wonderful Pops conductor who has been with us before and he's coming back, Jeff Reed, is bringing an incredible show that he's put together to celebrate the Beatles, yes, but specifically Sgt. Pepper. This is the Sgt. Pepper album beginning to end. That's the concert you get to experience. Straight through Sgt. Pepper, and I would presume that they're going to wear the costumes that your mind is thinking about right this very second. Mine as well. So that's the third Pops concert. The final Pops concert goes in a different direction. We like for the Pops to be a little bit of something, it's kind of a smorgasbord of the wonderful styles of music that are out there. And so we are welcoming a great superstar of the fiddle. Mark O'Connor is coming. And Mark O'Connor is an artist who really has a foot in many worlds. Like people like Chris Thiele, even Yo-Yo Ma, these are artists who really are so well versed in multiple worlds of music making. And um, I've had a chance to do Mark's fiddle concerto with him years and years ago um, with orchestra, and he'll be um, performing sort of everything from fiddling to folk music to some leaning classical to cross-genre music. But if you haven't heard Mark, he's a phenomenal, just world-class artist. So those are our four Pops concerts. There's one more concert that you might be curious about, and that concert is uh, the magic of Christmas. What I can tell you is that these are the dates. We feel that we just completed one of the most successful runs of magic we have done. We just um, anecdotally, I've never had the abundance of strong comments about the overall package of magic this past year. People felt we finally found the, we found the right combination of choral music and orchestral music and um, features by Cirque de la Symphony, etc. So we're, we're really enthused by this last year's magic and we're using that information to right now scheme for um, what delights we have for you for next year's magic. We have more to tell you about for the season. We have the Discovery Concert season to talk about coming up. Uh, Norman Wynn, our assistant conductor, will have uh, great things to tell you about that concert cycle for kids. So we're not revealing clearly every detail of everything tonight, but we felt it important here in January of 2016 to go ahead and get started. We want to get packets out to you as soon as possible. We want to get um, you enthused and thinking about next year's concerts. And uh, the nice part is we still have more 
uh, some more to tell you as we move along in the coming weeks. I, I hope this uh, gathering excites you about what's coming. Um, I hope it makes you feel that the 92nd season has a lot of incredible music in store. And uh, please just tell your friends and heck, tell your enemies. Just tell them to come and check out the concerts. Um, thank you all so much for being here. Hope to see you at tomorrow night's concert or at concerts in the future and certainly at a lot of the ones we talked about today. Thanks, everybody.